the last few years, Disney Star Wars has put out some amazing seasons of Star Wars, as well as some disappointing seasons. But where does Ahsoka land in that list? Today I'm going to stop and rank all seven Star Wars live action seasons from the worst to the best. While I'm talking, be sure to put your ranking down below in the comment section. My list isn't the right list, it's just my list and I'd love to see yours. Also, if you don't know, I have a second channel where I do kind of more editorial pieces talking about movie news and they're kind of more free form. So if you want more Sean Chandler and with a little bit of a different vibe to it, check out Sean Chandler Plus and let's get started. Easily in last place, the book of Boba Fett. Now, it's always fun to be in the world of Star Wars and it delivers that. You're spending time on Tatooine, you've got a bunch of action set pieces, so you get the Star Wars experience in that sense. There's a couple great moments sprinkled into it, but on a story level, they simply did not have enough story to tell to justify having a whole show for Boba Fett. And I'm not sure if that's because they just rushed the production so quickly that they couldn't develop the story, or if there just never was enough story here. But it's only, what, seven episodes long? And they still had to pad out the, the runtime with two episodes of The Mandalorian. And I don't even mean that in a joking sense. There's two episodes of this season that continue plot points from a different show and have very little <laughs> to do with the plot of Book of Boba Fett. And in fact, Mandalorian season three is a little bit confusing if you haven't seen Book of Boba Fett because there's two missing episodes hidden into an entirely different show. And I think maybe there could have been an idea here about Boba Fett taking over, becoming the lead gangster leader of Tatooine and exploring kind of this, I don't know, dances with wolves type story about him going primitive, living with the Tusken Raiders. But the way that all of these plot points are developed or not developed, none of it is satisfying. I assumed all the stuff with the Tusken Raiders was actually going to tie into the third act of the story of the season. Nope, they're just killed off. And so they set all these ideas up, they introduce ideas, but then there's no middle act. It just goes straight from setup to big final battle. No like twists, turns, development, anything like that. And beyond that, there's all sorts of sequences that just feel kind of cheaply produced, some odd choreography. So a real disappointment. Number six, Mandalorian season three. And this was just so incredibly disappointing because I loved the first two seasons so much. And they promised a bunch of really interesting ideas about reclaiming Mandalore. And the way they decided to tell all of their stories just fell so incredibly flat to me. It wasn't that season three was devoid of interesting conflict. Conflict. Mando needing to reclaim his honor. The battle for the Darksaber between two allies that might become two enemies. Reclaiming Mandalore. Moff Gideon's master plan with clones and all of the stuff going on with him. The rising Imperial Remnant. There's all of this great material to have an amazing season. But the way that it actually played out just felt so bland and dull. Episode two, he just goes to Mandalore and it's done. He doesn't have to go through any hoops. There's no real challenges that come along with uh, Mando trying to reclaim his honor. He just goes there and it's done. It's just done. There's little things where like they foreshadow this mythical creature and then they don't pay that off in the finale on the battle on the planet where the mythical creature is at. They have this idea about Moff Gideon becoming this cloned force user, and they don't do anything interesting with that. It's just tossed in at the very end, and then it's destroyed instantly. As soon as they introduce the interesting idea, it's destroyed. And all throughout the middle of the season, we're doing all these stupid side quests, which the show's always kind of done that, but in this season, it you felt it because they had all these more interesting ideas that were underdeveloped 
and instead focused on just throwaway little plots. So they're just tossing in Moff Gideon clones. They're just tossing in, oh yeah, you got his honor back. Oh, well, through a loophole, that's how um, Bo-Katan is able to get the Darksaber back. Just through a loophole. Not actually interesting conflict. And the whole season just felt like that. Of like, what are you doing? These are the least interesting ways to resolve these conflicts. And I think one of the biggest problems they ran into is that they brought Grogu back too quickly. They brought him back in a different show. So there was zero episodes where there was separation between uh, our two leads. And I think you could have saved that. Bring Grogu back, have him being trained all throughout the show by Luke and bring him back in the final episodes as they realize Moff Gideon's threat that he's cloning and is force using clones. And so we have to go get our force using friend and have the reunion take place then. Instead, they compromised Book of Boba Fett. They compromised this season. And it was just so underwhelming, which was so disappointing because the first two seasons were so fun and so satisfying. Number five, Kenobi. Another one that I was actually really excited for. Ewan McGregor has aged the perfect amount to be able to continue his version of Obi-Wan Kenobi. There's always that question, what was he kind of up to during those 20 years? And we finally get a story dedicated to him. I've also said so many times I want them to move away from this particular time period. The one exception I was like, what would actually be pretty cool is what if we saw what Kenobi was up to? What was his kind of part in the rebellion? All that fun stuff and then we got it and it had moments of greatness but as a season I don't think it worked as a whole and the big gigantic problem is for whatever reason it felt so cheap right out of the gate the first episode there's this chase sequence where Leia is running through some woods and there's people like running into trees I, I like I couldn't believe that they saw this and they didn't go, let's just cut that out. Like, have her turn around and run and cut to the end of it where someone's standing in front of her. We can't have people bumping into trees. There's a sequence later on in it where they literally do like the comedies bit where there's a guy wearing a trench coat with someone hiding inside of it. <laughs> you serious? They, they did that in Star Wars as a serious moment. And you're going, I don't know what's going on here. You're you're trying to explore this very emotional take on Obi-Wan, who's kind of losing faith and having to refine his strength, which I don't know that I need everyone, all of my heroes of my childhood to be deconstructed like this. But hey, we're doing something serious. And then you do such silly, poorly executed moments. You're having showdowns between Vader and Obi-Wan and then goofiness right afterwards. It also gets repetitious. Leia keeps getting kidnapped, keeps being rescued, and it's only six episodes long. And then Reva was just this very ill-conceived character. Maybe in some original version, and the screenwriters of when this was going to be a movie for the screen rather than a teleplay for television, has talked about how the character was different and they reworked it when it was adapted and it's not really his original vision. And so you get to this version of it and you're like, I don't... What what is what is her motivation? What what is she mad? What is she trying to do here? And and so it's just a character that didn't really work and that you didn't want in this story, didn't serve the story that was being told. And so there's these moments with, of course, you and McGregor that are fantastic, and these Vader moments that are really cool, and then a story that stretched out about 30% too long, some characters that you don't care about, and some terrible execution. So, another disappointment. Coming in at number four, Ahsoka. To be perfectly clear, pretty big gap between Kenobi and Ahsoka. I liked Ahsoka. Um, I thought it was good. I didn't think it was great, but it was definitely a good show. And if you're going to do, like, Star Wars as a TV show, this, this makes sense to me that this is the sort of thing that we would get. And the thing that immediately stuck out about this one is that of all of these seven seasons, this is the one that immediately just feels the most like classic Star Wars. Galactic threat, Jedi, Sith, a form of rebellion, Imperial remnants. Like, this one feels the most like it has the elements, the ingredients, lightsaber battles, blasters that you expect from Star Wars. 
other nice details in here. You get a couple of great villains with Ray Stevenson, who's sadly giving, I believe, his final performance in, in, in this one. And the standout character is just this interesting guy that was a Jedi. And then when he saw it all fall, he's reminiscing on it. And we don't really fully even understand where he's coming from. We don't know what is exactly is his goal. Um, where does he stand on all these things? And so just like this great character that you want more of, and I don't know if they're going to recast him. I don't know what this is going to look like, but they're still dangling threats. <laughs> they have questions about this guy and want to see more of what's kind of going on with him. And then, of course, Thrawn, this classic villain from the books from 30 years ago. They brought him into Rebels, and finally we get him in live action and it was cool. It was just as cool as you kind of hope that it would be seeing him in that fashion. And it, it was a story that I felt like had kind of like clear objectives of what we're trying to accomplish. What are the stakes? What are the complications? The different characters' motivations, even on the bad side, on the good side, you, very clear what we're trying to do. Or even when it's mysterious, we, we get it. In, there's a fun version of intrigue in that. And so you can get invested in the story. You feel like there's progress. We're moving ahead through things. I'd say where the maybe it, it didn't fully work for me is there's some just wacky Star Wars logic in here where uh, we've had a couple of characters, pretty big characters, get run through by a lightsaber. And that's a really bad thing. And then on Kenobi <laughs> and on this show, getting run through all the way the lightsabers like, oh, man. You got to sleep it off over the weekend. You'll be fine. And you got to go like, what? Now, is a lightsaber, is it like a bad, to be impaled in real life is pretty bad. Like, are they, what's going on here that a couple of these people are fine getting impaled? There's some of that Star Wars logic in here. Uh, another one is that I didn't find our returning Rebels characters, like any of them to be particularly compelling or interesting. They're less interesting here than they were in Rebels. Our lead character, Ahsoka, I think is very bland and dull with the way that she's characterized, which is frustrating. I, I don't want to want to say that, but like, as, like just a little anecdote. This is just family anecdote. Whenever my youngest was born, Karis, our middle child, Chloe, wanted to name Karis Ahsoka because she liked Ahsoka. So she was excited for this show and she gave up on it three episodes in because she said, it's boring. Ahsoka is so boring. And she was referring to the character. And they just characterize and just kind of like she's just doesn't have much spark to her that makes her interesting. And then I think Sabine is a lot more interesting, but in a very frustrating kind of way. And the show doesn't seem to acknowledge the fact that she's kind of awful. <laughs> We're about to have galactic war again because she missed her friend and she undoes her friend's sacrifice that was to save the galaxy, undoes it so she could see her friend again. And doesn't even acknowledge it when she meets him. She doesn't own up to it. She's like, oh, a lot of stuff happened. And no one seems to, like, hold her to task that this actually matters. Like, Ezra's sacrifice mattered. And now you've undone it. And it, it never owns some of that stuff. That was frustrating when you have some of those moments that your characters aren't as exciting as you want them to be. And it's not, they're, they're frustrating you rather than exciting you to see them. So that, that was a little disappointing, but just overall in general, like it felt like we're digging deeper into the world of Star Wars or expanding the lore. We're going to a different galaxy. We're bringing the witches into live action in this more elaborate sense. Uh, have zombie troopers, just a bunch of fun stuff in there. I know some people like picked on the, the choreography and some of the lightsaber battles. And I get that this is, they do have Disney money. Also, it is a TV show. So like what I expect from a TV show is kind of different, but also, I don't know, we have Disney money. It's hard to give it the benefit of that doubt I would give to any other TV show. But overall, I, I dug it. I liked it. This is, this feels like, yeah, we got some Star Wars. We expanded things and it made me excited to either get Ahsoka season two, or if this is the setup for the Mandoverse movie, which I'm sure it is, all of that sounds good to me. It made me excited for the future. I want to see more. I want to follow this up um, and that it didn't have a fully happy ending. I kind of dug that too. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to share your ranking down below in the comment section. Also, if you're a fan of Star Wars and my content, I have done an enormous amount of Star Wars content, rankings and reviews on this channel, as well as different editorial pieces over on my second channel, Sean Chandler Plus. 
If you enjoyed this video, there's almost certainly something else that you'll enjoy. In third place, Mandalorian season two. And as a Star Wars fan, this season just put such a big gigantic grin on my face from beginning to end where you're spending time in the world of Star Wars and a big thing that this season did was take characters from the novels and from the animated shows and pull them into live action. And of course, it closes things out by bringing back Luke in his prime to save the day to train Grogu. And it was just so much fun that each week we're seeing new characters for the first time, or maybe we're seeing for the first time in live action, for the first time in 35 years. So many cool different experiences. And it had this arc that did lead to a very satisfying conclusion, not just because Luke was there, but because it is the, the payoff of Grogu's journey, Mando, having this arc. He's not this character that has a bunch of different dimensions to him. He's very straightforward. He's committed to this, this core, but this child means so much to him that he would put aside this creed that he lives by, take his helmet off because he has to save Grogu in one episode and then just has to see Grogu in the next one. There's something very profound and powerful about that and a nice crescendo with a cameo to just take it to that whole other level. Now, I mean... When it comes to this season, the individual episodes, it gets very repetitious on a writing level. It's, we need to find the next place to go. So we'll go to this place, we'll have a cameo, we'll have a little adventure, and they'll tell us the next place to go to find the next place to find the thing at the end of the season. So then when the next episode, we go to the place, we have a cameo, we have a little adventure, and they tell us the next place to go and rinse and repeat for the whole episode, so or whole season. So it does that quite a bit. It's thinner on story and the individual episodes, the standalone side quests, I don't think are as interesting as the ones in season one or as they're not as fresh, but still an absolute blast that I thoroughly enjoy. Our runner up Mandalorian season one. And this season will always be something special for me and my family because it was the first time ever that both me and my kids were excited about a new show, show coming out, that they saw the trailers and they went, oh, I want to go check that out. And it became kind of a family tradition that we would wake up, watch the episode before they would go to school. And it was like a neat tradition that we had as a family. And it was cool that we had weekly live action Star Wars with nice production value. That it, And it was the, the good version of doing something new in Star Wars where we're spending time in that world. You're getting the adventure that you want in this galaxy far, far away, but it's not just a rehash. It's not another a big epic galactic battle. It's not a traditional hero's journey in the same sense, but it is a story that feels like it fits and complements what we liked before. And what it did really nicely, I think, or at least did best in season one is that it had this over it, the story for the whole season about Mando forming a relationship with Grogu and trying to save him from whatever the Imperials are up to. But then a lot of it was about these kind of little standalone stories while they're often hiding. And as time is passing, what I really enjoyed about this season is it really felt like they were pulling from all of these classic formulas for like Westerns. So episode four, four, where like Cara Dune is introduced, it's like a mini version of the Magnificent Seven, where there are these mercenaries that are hired to battle people off. And I, I dug that. And then we have the the break-in episode and all sorts of stuff. They're just, they're, they're nice little standalone stories that fit. All of it kind of building to the big finale in the final two episodes where there's loss, there's victory, there's little surprises. So it was just a really nice little addition to the world of Star Wars that was such a pleasant surprise and that they kept Grogu a secret. He wasn't in the marketing. You literally got to the end of the first episode and you're like, oh, it's like a baby Yoda. And he was as adorable as you would hope and formed a bond there that you weren't expecting to be so powerful, especially by the time you get to the end of season two. So great season. But coming in in first place is Andor. Now, this is always a little bit tricky because I think Mandalorian seasons one and two deliver, I believe, kind of 
more of what you traditionally expect from Star Wars. They're more kind of fun and consumable in that regard. And so in that sense, they're better Star Wars. Andor is very different. It's an entirely new type of experience in the world of Star Wars. And so it's almost categorically different while still being in the same category. But I think just on terms of overall writing, world building, developing Star Wars, and being the most mature Star Wars we've ever received, I think I just have to put Andor in the top spot. And what I what I loved about it is that it, it delivered a type of Star Wars story that I didn't know that I wanted. It developed the world of the rebellion in a sense that I, I wasn't expecting. It was something fresh and new that added layers to everything that came before. If you think of what the rebellion actually was and what it would take for it to happen, it tells those stories. And what I also really dug about this season is that it was 12 episodes long and kind of told in these little mini arcs. And because of that, it feels a little bit like three or four TV movies spread across a season, each of them having their own little crescendo. And so the first couple of episodes, I was like, I oh, know this is a little bit slow. I wish this would kick into high gear. And then it would. And then it would slow down. We'd rebuild. And then we'd have this incredible heist. And then we'd slow down. We'd rebuild. We'd end up in prison. And then we'd have this big epic ex escape. And so it kept having like this s s pause breathe, rebuild, and bang, does it again, all while kind of having these characters that are that are more complex and more nuanced. It's definitely not just good and bad. It's very layered characters where the good guys are doing very bad things and they're shady people. And I, I just thought all of that worked so well. It was so satisfying by the end of it. And I love that we're, we have something in the world of Star Wars like this. If you don't like Andor and you think, ah, this isn't what I signed up for with Star Wars, where there's not enough aliens, there's not enough lightsaber, whatever it is, there's not enough force, I get it. I don't in any way hold that against you. If you watched this, thought it was too slow, too different, this isn't Star Wars for you, that makes in all entire sense to me. Totally not even going to try and convince you. I'm, I understand what you're saying. For me, I love having this additional little piece fleshing out the world of the rebellion and what it would take and being so thematically rich in the process of doing so. So for me, it comes in at number one. If you enjoyed this video, remember I've got way more Star Wars content right over there in that Star Wars playlist or over on Sean Chandler Plus, my other channel with more kind of editorial type pieces. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV to me.